he got no further than the corner. News that Castillo had been murdered soon reached the police station. Outraged, his comrades demanded that all right-wing extremists should be rounded up. Headquarters sent them a list. It was Lieutenant Leon Lupion who gave out the names to the arrest squads. A los oficiales que había por aquí les fuimos entregando. I handed out two or three names to each of the other officers, and they went off in police vans with several guards. And finally, there was just one van left in the corner there, van number 17. Van 17 was the last to set out at three in the morning. Nobody knows who was on its list for arrest. All that is clear is that a van arrived at the home of the leader of the opposition, the right-winger Jose Calvo Sotelo. They asked him to step down to the station for questioning. He promised to telephone soon to his family, unless, he added, these gentlemen blow my brains out. dead body was dumped at the gate of the East Cemetery. It was not the authorities who had ordered his arrest, but there was no way the government could escape the blame. The leader of the opposition had been assassinated in the custody of the government's own special police. The Calvo Sotelo murder brought the fury of conservative Spaniards to its peak. Its timing, a malign coincidence, offered the army plot mass support at a crucial moment. Entonces, todas las dudas y vacilaciones que aún existían... It was then that all the doubts and hesitation about whether to call the uprising immediately or to wait for the disintegration to spread so that we would be more justified, all those doubts disappeared. Within hours of the murder, Muller dispatched a coded telegram. It read... On the 15th last, at 4 a.m., Helen gave birth to a beautiful child. Hidden here were the date, time and place of the uprising. July 18th, at 5 a.m., in Morocco. The Republican government knew that Spain was close to explosion, but it failed to take seriously the approaching spark, the military uprising. The left knew all too well what was coming, and the workers were already garrisoning party and trade union offices. At midnight, the socialist leader, Indeletio Prieto, with some of his colleagues, met the Prime Minister, Casares Quiroga. They had begged him to arm the people, but Casares thought this would fling away the last hopes of law and order. He refused. At dawn, on July 14th, Captain Bebb took off from Casablanca. Destination? the Canary Isles. That same morning, the funerals of Castillo and Calvo Sotelo took place. Clenched fists for Castillo's coffin. The straight-arm fascist salute for Calvo Sotelo. What remained a political middle ground in Spain was crumbling. Disaster now seemed inevitable. Juan Molina was an anarchist militant in Barcelona. We hadn't slept at home for several nights. We were grabbing what sleep we could on floors of the Union and our newspaper offices. We were waiting for the inevitable. In our newspapers, we were telling our members to be prepared. Everybody was ready because we knew the coup was bound to come. Josep Taradez, the Catalan leader, called on the Prime Minister, but Casares Quiroga still refused to see what was about to happen. 
While we were chatting, news arrived of army unrest in Morocco. There were reports that some generals were about to rise, although General Franco's name still wasn't being mentioned. So then I told him, my friend Casares, I'm convinced that the army is going to rise against Spanish democracy. He said, I'm sure it won't. Casares Quiroga could not believe the generals would go so far. But on July 17th, the day before it was planned, the rising erupted here in Malia. Next day, it spread to other towns in Morocco, even before General Franco had arrived to lead the Army of Africa. The military plotters assumed that their coup d'etat would succeed swiftly. The government of the Republic, in turn, thought it was strong enough to stamp out this erratic rising. Both were terribly wrong. The rising spread to the mainland, and the rebel generals soon controlled great tracts of the countryside. But the workers were now at last given arms, and with loyal police units, they defeated the military in most of Spain's industrial cities. There could be no rapid victory either way. The rising swelled into full-blown counter-revolution. On the other side, the workers now pouring out to the barricades were using their rifles for a Spain which was to become not just republican, but revolutionary. There was no way left to prevent the conflict which was to rage across Spain for almost three years. There could be no more negotiation, no compromise. It could only be civil war.